Hello everyone, um, I'm Andrews. I am a CG artist and I've been in CG uh, for, around, for around 15 years now. Professionally, I've been uh, doing CG for the last 10 years. And um, uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, lighting, shading and rendering because that's the field that I'm mostly interested in. Uh, basically, I consider myself as a, more of a generalist, which means that I'm interested in all type of, um, I mean, in all fields of, of CG. Uh, but um, it so happened that in my experience, I kind of concentrated mostly on characters uh, and uh, and in general lighting and shading. Uh, currently, work uh, I work as an uh, art director in a studio which is called Fox 3D, and uh, we work with video games. We are uh, outsource uh, partners, so we usually get to be hired by other uh, developers, indie developers, and, uh, and, and even AA uh, game uh, developers and stuff like that. So in my job, I do less of CG, uh, but more of a management. I'm responsible for hiring artists, giving them tasks, uh, making sure that they do them right and uh, deliver the final product to the client. Now, uh, for the very long time, I've been um, uh, doing rendering and, and lighting using production rendering, uh, which means that uh, basically um, when I had the final output, I would have to render it, and that would take a long time. Like, for example, if you see uh, Hollywood movies like Avatar and, and any type of blockbusters, uh, they usually use, not usually always, they use uh, production rendering, which actually takes a lot of time. Like uh, one single frame to render in a movie takes around one hour on average. Um, obviously, they have a lot of render farms and stuff like that, so that takes a little bit longer. But even, uh, even if you want to at least render one frame, it usually takes one hour. So when you're doing tests and, 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 and you're making something, um, you still spend a lot of time uh, rendering. So two years ago, I got interested in real-time graphics in general because I saw that uh, real-time engines started to produce really good results and, and I was kind of interested for the first time. I never looked into uh, real-time graphics very seriously. I like games, but uh, for a very long time they kind of looked I don't know, bad, you know, compared to the production rendering. But finally, when I saw some of the samples of real time, I realized that this is uh, fun stuff to try out. So, so, so that I did. And I chose Unreal Engine 4, and this is what I'm going to show today, because I'm not a type of a guy who likes PowerPoint slides. I actually brought with myself a few examples that I made myself on Unreal Engine 4, and I'm going to show you them live. Uh, they, I didn't consider them as my personal work. They're sort of uh, more of um, my playground. When I usually, when I learn something, I like to, uh, I don't know, think of an excuse why uh, what I want to do, you know, just to go in depth with something. So, so the first example I'm going to show you is. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I started to learn Unreal Engine uh, for like two years ago. So um, I watched some tutorials, I started to play around with the software, I really liked it, and the learning curve was very smooth actually for me. And when I felt like I was comfortable with it, I thought, okay, I need to do something. So for the first thing I remember back then, I just uh, simply went to uh, Google and just kind of wanted to get the model of something, you know, just to have this, um, you know, test object for something, you know, for lighting and shading and stuff like that. So I chose um, an Alien Queen, a famous Alien Queen, and probably most of you know it, um, a model which is actually an original model from a very old game, uh, which is called Alien vs. Predator, I think, which was uh, made in 2010. So it's actually quite a poor model. It has like 8,000 polygons or something. It's nothing really very serious. And, um, but I took it because I thought, that's OK. Let's see how far can I go with this, I don't know, low poly model. And uh, I put it into Unreal Engine 4. Uh, I started to play around a little bit with textures. I added some additional layers of micro, detail, micro uh, details and, um, 
and I added some few lights, uh, post-production and stuff like that. And I kind of liked the result. I mean, I, I was actually, it, it, it surpassed my expectations. So I realized that, all right, let's, let's go a little bit further. So I took the model, I rigged it, and I animated it. And uh, one of my friends, actually, one of my friends actually, who is working with sound design, he made even a sound for it. And it kind of turned out in the end uh, a short video, um, which later I even uploaded on YouTube, and it kind of got uh, half of a million views or something, which was a little bit surprising for me. So I actually have the sample here, and this is the same module that I showed you um, just before which is already in Unreal Engine 4 running. So I can actually run it in real time. <coughs> and uh, basically what I did, um, I can actually switch to other layers as well and show it. Um, it has the same poly count, but I use shaders that, um, that actually tessellate the module, so they improve the quality. But in general, this is the same module. It's just rigged, animated, and and, and done with, uh, with the lighting that's going in Unreal Engine 4. So there is nothing actually complicated about this scene, but this shows really so well power of this engine, and in general, current gen of uh, engines, uh, that you can actually quite quickly produce the results, which is quite pleasing. Like, for example, even that uh, level of quality, if I would need to, you know, um, make with a post-production render, I would still need to render it, uh, and it would take, like, a lot of time. So, yeah, uh, now I actually left it so I can uh, walk it around after the animation finishes, and now the animation is repeating. I often find hard to explain for people who are not into gaming what real time is. So I think that now I can actually illustrate a, a little bit better that real time is actually when you can watch animation, but you can do it interactively. So I can now actually watch it from different angles, see it, which is like it's happening right now. It, the computer is rendering this at this moment, which is fascinating because, you know, uh, like I said, uh, we did, even in the Fox 3D studios, I did, uh, uh, I worked on a game called Subnautica and we were doing a trailer for it. So uh, uh, we were rendering a teaser for Subnautica and it uh, took like one minute or so and we had to actually render it back then. So we use Render Farm and it quite costs a lot, you know. So if I would knew back then on Real Engine 4, I would definitely would do it back then it would be a lot you know quicker and faster and cheaper and so on anyway that was my first test and uh, when i got it i thought all right that's cool uh, i want to see how far can i go further with this so for the te uh, for the next uh, test i remember i watched unreal engine 4 actually the epic games who made unreal engine 4 uh, they released the documentation about their automotive material pack. They actually released it for free, and uh, they were explaining how uh, they made this sample of the car, and uh, they put those shaders in. And I got interested in it because um, they also explained how you can a little bit tweak Unreal Engine 4 to boost up the quality of reflections and overall quality. So. I thought, all right, I want to check it out myself. And uh, I had this uh, other sample, which also was made for the presentation. It was uh, back then made for a different presentation, but now I started to use this example for, for other presentations. And it actually took me, I don't know, like three hours probably make it, you know. Uh, again, I didn't model the car myself. I took it from Arc Models library. Uh, I didn't even optimize it for to be to ready for game. So it has like 3 million polygons. And, you know, it's, again, running real time on my laptop without any problems at all, you know. So <coughs> uh, the first thing is, well, if you, you know, the reflections doesn't come to be so smooth uh, when you run in Unreal Engine 4. You have to slightly tweak it a little bit. Um, 
but it works because the scene is not complicated. You have only one module here, which is heavy in polygons, but it's not crowded. So Unreal Engine handles very well, and it's running real time again on my laptop without any problems. Considering the fact that um, it's 3K, and you, you can't see that, of course, on a projector, but um, on an average PC, if you have full HD, it would run, it, it would not even require any uh, kind of, I don't know, hard hardcore PC or something, you know. So again, if I would, for example, need to do this visualization, I don't know, like rendering in render, rendering with production render, no matter what I use, even GPU renders, which are a lot faster than CPU renders, I would still need uh, much, much, much more time, you know, for that. Um, so yeah, um, the other thing is, uh, um, yeah, you can see it. I'm going to it's going to finish the animation. I'm going to show a little bit around because, again, like in previous example, I can walk around. And yeah, so again, a simple scene, nothing fancy. I made uh, an environment, and basically that was made just you know to have something to reflect on this car, you know, and. Um, yeah, again, I can switch to other uh, uh, wireframes to show that the polygon count, you know, it's it's actually not very heavy. It, the Unreal Engine 4 can handle a lot more. The Unreal Engine 4 sample uh, that you can watch made by Epic has, I think, even 9 million polygons. Um, I, can, uh, I can't show it now, but um, uh, back in my home, I have HTC Vive, so I even for a little bit tried to see it in VR. And VR is, as you know, it's, it's very consuming in, in, in terms of uh, PC requirements, you know. So uh, it, it, ran, uh, it, it ran on VR as well easily without any problems at all, you know. So, again, really amazing. <laughs> uh, for me, as a CG artist who has been so long doing long renders and, you know, waiting and stuff like that, this was really, really amazing, you know. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's what you can see, it's, it's, it's going to be easily integrated into games, you know, and you've probably already seen some really cool games that look really, really realistic. We are already there, you know, it's just that we need a little bit more time to learn to control it, you know. <clears throat> so yeah, um, uh, all right, after this, I, like I mentioned before, I am... Um, I was always interested in character development, basically because, especially female characters, because that's actually one of the most sensitive uh, subjects that you can do in CG, uh, because it requires a lot of attention for uh, small micro details. Uh, human eye is very sensitive to uh, to character. I mean, in general, when we watch the character, and if something is wrong, we always, you know, notice it especially if it's a female or a child, because uh, usually they have a lot smoother skin, and if you do something wrong, uh, any type of person can see it instantly, you know. If we have, for example, older people, it's a lot easier to fool somebody that is real, because they have a lot of blemishes and stuff like that, and you, know, you can more easily like cheat a little bit psychologically and, and fool somebody. So. I thought, all right, let's see how can Unreal Engine uh, handle the characters, you know. And this is something that I'm still, you know, uh, working a little bit. It's it's sort of in progress stuff. Uh, but uh, the reason I'm showing is that what I really like is uh, Unreal Engine 4 has a very extremely awesome shaders. And, uh, well, it's not Unreal Engine 4. I mean, in general, basically all of the engines have the... And uh, what's awesome about them is that um, for a very long time, we usually had this typical uh, walkthrough where you have a model and you have a textures, and the quality of textures was determined by how big those textures are. But now when we need like very extreme detailing, no matter what size of texture you are going to use, it's still not going to be enough. So what uh, basically new engines th thought of, uh, which was for a very long time used in production, I mean, standard rendering and workflow, uh, they started to develop procedural so-called shaders, which means that you can overlay several textures on one. So uh, like 
when you need details, you can actually have details like seeing micro details on a skin. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can see it. Uh, and this is not coming from a main texture. It's coming from the secondary texture, so-called micro detailing. And I can easily control it uh, with like, even make it like that and stuff like that. Keeping the main uh, texture on the model, I can have control over the second one. I can even actually boost the intensity of it. Uh, of it. And I, I can see it in real time without doing any test renders. It's just that. So yeah, we, um, when you get to this point, you have to ask yourself, don't you? What's the point? <laughs> uh, uh, basically, when we play now games, uh, we already see some good samples. If, uh, for example, uh, some of you already played the game on PlayStation 4 called The Order 8086, you probably know or saw the quality. And I, for example, personally, am very sure that if uh, anyone would walk into the room without knowing that this is a game, would saw the screen of that game, for at least five seconds, he would totally believe it that this is a movie screen. So we already have that type of quality. Now what, uh, what needs to be done is that a lot of developers need to learn how to use it. And we are going to have much, much more better quality, not only in video games, but in general. Like, uh, I'm working in the Fox 3D now, and for a very long time, or basically for, for the whole time I've been working in Fox 3D studios, we were working with video games. But now when the quality became a lot better, uh, we get to get a lot of projects which are not related with games at all, uh, because a lot of people just got interested when they saw the quality that real time can produce. So my last two projects, uh, one of them was, um, training system in VR, which is dedicated to um, teach uh, medical students to identify um, patients who have this um, syndrome or, or sickness, I don't know how to call it, it's called delirium. Um, so we actually produced a very realistic, I can't show it, sorry, it's under, under NDA, but um, we produced a very realistic old human being lying in a bed who is animated and he's showing the signs of uh, his inadequate movements and stuff like that. And a student who is uh, learning about this has to identify where, whether he is just confused or whether he's, there is something a little bit more. Uh, the other project I'm working is, um, is coming from the ship industry. And they are, again, making a teaching um, software for um, technical people who are learning how to integrate cooler systems into the ships. So again, we're using very realistic type of um, uh, pipes and stuff like that because you actually have to show them when they're broken or worn out. So you can actually put all, all the rust and stuff like that and make it look realistic, you know, so they can actually identify. And we're using real photos to make sure that the reference matches, you know. Um, <coughs> the current issue is, um, with the real time in general is, not with the real time, but in general what we have now is because, like I mentioned before, most of the developers just don't know how to control it. I have one example which was made by the guy who has a lot of uh, experience in general with, um, I'm sorry, uh, with, uh, with character development, he's actually one of the guys who made uh, the famous Meagle for the Lord of Rings. So he actually got interested in Unreal Engine 4 as well for the same reasons that I'm talking about. And but of course, he has a lot of uh, has a lot of a lot more. I don't know how to say it. Uh, hardware and uh, basically experience uh, to produce good stuff. So. What he did is not that not only he made a very realistic character, but he also pushed a little bit further by making a very realistic facial capture. Uh, again, most of you probably play games, so you already it's 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 very common to see a very unrealistic characters, and most of the time they are unrealistic because not because they look bad, but 
if you would see the static image of them, they would probably look okay or good. But when you start to see them moving, you already can see that it's fake. And this is happening because most of the time, facial animation, of uh, which is transferred from the real person's face to a, a digital character, for a very long time, it was directly transferred. And uh, this is why it call, caused a lot of you know, micro um, errors and stuff like that, which is actually called Uncanny Valley. Um, so what he did, and what most of the advanced developers now do these days, um, they don't directly uh, transfer the facial animation to a character. What they do is uh, they make a very advanced trick for facial animation, and they use real characters' animation just to control that trick. So I have one of the samples where they actually made uh, Barack Obama, and uh, they use this facial animation rig for it. It uses a lot of stress maps uh, of normals. So, for example, if he, he raises his eyebrows, you can see the wrinkles. Again, this is running in real time. And they actually even released um, a VR demo, uh, which you can actually download for free if you own HTC Vive. It's, it's only for HTC Vive. And um, Basically, this is, I, I don't remember his name now, but he, he is the guy who is making the voice for Simpsons. Uh, he's performing here, and, and uh, just, this is just a simple test, you know, they just wanted to see if it's working out. So you can actually see that uh, it doesn't match, the facial features doesn't match with the actor, but still, when he is moving, it's, it's like uh, the Obama digital character is not like directly uh, doing the, the same, but he's like, like mimicking his um, animation of, of facial, so which is which is why it looks realistic. <coughs> so this is what where we are currently are. It's just that uh, I've noticed in my experience that most of the developers still just don't know how to use it because it requires a lot of not only technical knowledge, but a lot of experience to tweak everything around. Those facial rigs actually takes a lot of time to, uh, to rig, and not, because only, uh, not only because they are complicated, but because they really require a good trained eye to make everything okay. Like, for example, if I am able to make a very huge smile, you know, and stuff like that, but um, the character you're doing digital cannot do it, you have to limit that ability in his rig. So even if I do like unrealistic, very, you know, like over the top expression, he won't be able to do it because you just put the limits there. Um, so yeah, and um, basically I am one of those ambitious people uh, who thinks that in less, in less than, I don't know, probably five years or so, maybe 10, we are going to have real-time rendering probably replacing the production rendering. A lot of CG artists actually disagrees with me. And uh, yeah, probably, because, you know, we won't be able probably to have like very huge scenes like ILM makes, uh, I don't know, when, when you have a lot of stuff happening and, and everything is blowing, you know, in real time it's a little bit complicated. But for most majority of industry where we have um, architectural visualizations, uh, simple object visualizations and stuff like that. In 10 years, I think uh, simple production rendering is going to be outdated. Um, I actually thought what still needs to be done in real-time rendering in order to become as good as production rendering. So the main, main thing is actually the retracer. The retracer is the thing that is uh, basically responsible for all the reflections. Well, it's very raw to explain it that way, but uh, to understand this, it's mostly um, uh, responsible for reflections. So, for example, when you saw the example with the car that I showed, it shows those uh, uh, um, reflections pretty well, but uh, the problem is that those re reflections are static, which means that if I, for example, rotated this whole room, uh, nothing would happen on a car. Uh, because they are actually uh, put on a uh, probe that is uh, very static. So you cannot animate them, and it's still faking it. Also, uh, <coughs> a lot of time, uh, 
you see that uh, if you're going and uh, something disappears from the screen, you cannot see the reflection on, on, uh, on the object itself. That's again a, a little bit of a problem. In general, the quality of it is poor, but uh, it's still very good considering the fact that it's real time. And, uh, and for now, we have to cheat it. I mean, real-time render engines have to cheat it, but I think in 10 years, when the hardware gets better and the software might probably think of something, I know, smart as well, we actually can, you know, overstep this. And this moment when we are going to overstep this, this is going to be when the point where real-time rendering engine is going to become compared with the production rendering, because at this moment, we still have this huge uh, difference between those two. So the other thing is global illumination. Well, we already have some raw examples of global illumination. Global illumination is when the light bounces from the objects and it illuminates the whole scene. It's, again, a very hard thing to fake in real-time uh, graphics because it requires a lot of calculations. So for now, we can do a static in-render uh, global illumination. Or already we have some raw uh, real-time dynamic global illumination, but it still lacks in quality. I've seen some tests, they're quite amazing for real time, but they're still not there. Uh, shadows as well, probably I would put shadows in a ray tracer as well, but um, still they kind of, not only that they lack in the quality, they lack in a lot of other parameters as well. We need to boost that as well. Jittering to various micro errors as well. This is a problem because in real time, you have you, you cannot use infinitive uh, numbers, so you have to make them a little bit smaller, and that causes some micro problems, and you can see them jittering something and stuff like that. So even if you would be able to produce something very realistic, and those jitters would be seen, and I think they're going to be seen for a very long time. In a, even in a production render, if you keep the low samples, those jitters are, um, are seen. So in real time, they're seen even, even more. But uh, that thing is a very small thing, but it gives away. It gives away that it's a fake, you know, so we need to improve that as well. And um, low sample anti-aliasing. Anti Again, this is, it, this is not, not a huge problem because we can actually already cheat a little bit with that. We can, the, only, the one sheet that works is making resolution very, very big, very big and then downsampling it to a little bit smaller. So it's... It's sort of like subsampling, it becomes like a subsampling, so it kind of works. But again, uh, we could use a little bit more advanced anti-aliasing uh, anti as well. And low quality of post-process. Again, uh, post-production is actually quite amazing. I, uh, at least I tried it in Unreal Engine 4 and it was quite, surprising, quite surprisingly good, but it's still not there. If I would do post-production like in, I don't know, Fusion or, or, or Nuke, which is uh, a video, I don't know, standard, so... Uh, it would be a lot better, but again, in real time, you can see a post-production which is happening in real time. In uh, render it uh, image, you have a lot of quality in it. Again, but this is, I think, some small problem which can be overcome, so I think they're going to do it as well. Maybe this will go with some sampling of anti-aliasing as well. So, yeah, um, that's it. I don't know if you have any questions. Go ahead.